This Real Agriculture podcast is brought to you by Genesis Fertilizers. Nitrogen fertilizer is your farm's number one expense. Farmers are working together through Genesis Fertilizers to solve the problem of high prices and security of supply by planning a state-of-the-art nitrogen plant. Security and earnings through ownership is the solution. Visit Genesis today at genesisfertilizers.com to learn more. Brought to you by Profitable Practices, Real Egg Shops, and the Canola School. From preceding cedar setup and checks to pest ID and advice on nutrient management decisions through to harvest management, Real Agriculture's Canola School video series tackles every facet of the canola growing season in an engaging and informative format. The Canola School is made possible through sponsorship by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Learn more at canolaschool.com. Hi, welcome everyone to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Uh, this is the show where we take one agronomic topic, two guests, and we have a whole lot of fun with it. So thanks for joining us here. Of course, if you collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist. Let us know you watch the show and uh, we'll get you lined up with those credits. And a uh, big hello to everyone joining us already on uh, YouTube or on Wild TV. So on RFD TV Canada, yes, that's right. Welcome here as well. Uh, let's bring in our guests because we've got a lot to cover and not a long time to do it. So tonight's topic, it is maximum canola yield, three ways to build it or maintain it. That's a key one here. Uh, we've got Brunel Sabrin with Ontario Agronomy and Jack Payne of South Country Co-op, Manitoba and Alberta represented tonight. How are you doing, Brunel? Fantastic, how are you? I'm doing well. And Jack, you, you survived the polar we, vortex. We survived the polar vortex, barely. Um, yeah, I've been in Olds just over 22 years, and I do not remember minus 40 on a thermometer and minus 50 wind chill. Like at this point, we don't even have to say Celsius. They, they meet at minus 40 that's how cold it is yeah so for yep. yeah for all of our american friends and uh and for any of you watching from bc um that's how cold it was anyway brunel you are in brandon taking in egg days can you count mm -hmm. how many egg days you've been to would you even no. know that number all of them no um <laughs> well probably only the second time that i've been attend in attendance all three days yeah so, so you'll, it's, it's exciting. It's our first year with a booth for our company, Antera. We entered our agronomy benchmarking into the innovation showcase. So we're in the running to win you. the agribusiness category. All right. Well, we'll stay tuned and see how that turns out. That's uh, that's pretty mm -hmm. exciting. All right. And I see that John is back in the chat and Ray, of course, joining us from Calgary uh, as well. So good to see everybody on. Uh, let's talk canola. Oh, my gosh. The Cinderella crop as it is called, those beautiful yellow flowers. I was going to wear a yellow shirt. I don't own any. Um, so there you go. I tried. But let's talk a little bit uh, about last season before we talk about the season to come up. Uh, Brunel, how did the year end up for Southern Manitoba? Uh, I would say canola was a big surprise for us, especially where we are. Well, I think it was dry everywhere, but um, we still managed to get some decent yields. Uh, we took advantage of some later season rain, I guess. It was a it was a slow start to spring. It was kind of cold, and then it turned hot right away. So we had lots of heat units. Uh, probably the smoke from the forest fires helped us again as well. We have seen that once before in my career, where we get some hazy weather in July, and it just seems to moderate the temperatures a little bit and lets that canola hang in there a little bit longer. And, but yeah, there was an extra five, ten bushels over what we were expecting, considering how little rainfall we had this year. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say that about canola, it adapts and it surprises us, I think, more times than not. Jack, of course, you did as long mention. As you can keep it alive. Yes, I'm okay. Not... For now, don't get greedy. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we do need to keep the first, it alive. The first, the first month is crucial. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But, Jack, uh, speaking of dry, definitely a dry season, but you cover a pretty big area. How did the year turn out for canola in your area? 
Well, for Alberta, you know, it, it was a story of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, you know, uh, southern Alberta, you know, the drought, you know, it just hammered us. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a struggle. Um, you know, even central Alberta, we were on pins and needles until, you know, towards the end of June. We were well below, you know, normal uh, precipitation, well below 30-year average. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, towards the end of June, we caught, our, you know, a three to four inch rain that just, uh, you know, saved our bacon. And then, of course, you had, you know, northern Alberta, northeastern Alberta, the Edmonton area, and then east over to Lloydminster. And, you know, they, 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 were, they were the haves. Uh, we were the have-nots. They were the haves. You know, they, they did quite well. So, um, you know, um, again, you know, surprisingly, in the dry areas, we got probably a few more bushels than what we thought. Um, thank goodness we didn't have as much of an issue this year with flea beetles as we did the previous year. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's a very resilient crop. It will, you know, it, 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 it's a survivor. Mm -hmm. Now, John, who, who hails from uh, Bruce County, Ontario, uh, wants us to sell him on planting this crop. And I will tell you this, John. I can't vouch for, we're going to talk mostly about spring canola here because this is Western Canada and, and for the most part, that's all you're going to see. Um, it is a resilient crop. It, it branches like crazy. Uh, it will compensate. We've even had years where it came back from the dead. We had zombie canola that started flowering, trying desperately to set seed late in the year. Um, so that is pretty, it is pretty amazing. But as Brunel uh, alluded to those early days and weeks are just so key. So that is usually a flea beetle issue, but not always. We're going to talk about that, but let's start with that most important pass with the seeding pass. And we can take this a few different directions. So this will take us a bit to get, to get through, but Brunel, I'll start with you. Let's start with seeding depth or seeding speed. Which one do you think matters more? Uh depends on the piece of equipment that you have and the fuel conditions, I guess, to determine what kind of speed you can go. Planting depth or seeding depth is one that, and I think it votes for all of the crops. The more you, you can get it into uniform moisture, the better it is. Um, for us, we're probably, just to set the preface, we're probably 50-50 planters versus air drills, and whether that's disc or hoe. Um, so I've seen some pretty amazing things in terms of planting canola and chasing moisture going down to depth. We've planted the first year I was involved with some guys planting canola. Uh, we were probably put some in at an inch and a half, inch and three quarter. And some of the veterans that had been doing it for a couple of years already said, don't even worry about it. Don't bat an eye. It'll come out of the ground. And it goes against anything we've ever been taught in terms yeah. of putting canola in the ground. We're usually the shallower, the better. And, yeah, with the planter, I don't know if it's it's the it's sidewall packing versus on row packing that makes mm. the difference, but it just comes up picket fence. So for that, that that's one of the bonuses of using a planter. Now, now, Jack, the the question always, especially in very dry conditions, I mean, canola is a teeny teeny little seed, and so to Brunel's point, we're often you know, told you can't bury it or it's just going to be so spindly by the time it reaches the surface. But how comfortable would you be at one and a half inches down there if that's where the moisture is? Well, Lindsay, if you want to get an argument going between agronomists, you know, that's the question. What What is the, what's the <laughs> best seeding depth for canola? Is it a half an inch or is it an inch and a half? Um, and what you're going to find is, and, and it, it is, you know, it all depends. I mean, in agronomy, everything we need to do, we need to preface it with it depends because I've seen successful uh, in, in, in both situations. Um, when we think about uh, 2021, 2022, those dry years, you know, gain comparable to what we just came through in, uh, this year. But, you know, what I saw those years where farmers, you know, they say, well, they had to chase the moisture. So um, if you've got a seed stranded in a half an inch to three quarters of an inch of dry soil, what is it? You know exactly what the outcome is going to be. It's not even going to germinate. So in some situations, yeah, you, you can go down an inch and a half, uh, inch, um, you know, uh, and get down to some of that moisture. And again, I think the key is packing, is to get that water effect to move some of that moisture, you know, into, into the into the seed row. But uh, it, it, you can, you know, uh, there would be some arguments, oh, that's way too deep. 
Uh, I've, I've seen it come from there and you, you know, it's pretty hard to argue with a grower that says, Hey, I've got a canola crop and my neighbor across the road at half inch has got nothing. Mm -hmm. And, and to put this in perspective, Jack, I mean, we saw just last fall where spring crops did not germinate all summer and with a bit of rain late in the year, they germinated in the fall. So that's how dry it was. It is possible to not get enough moisture in yeah. that top inch, right? So yeah. uh, it definitely happens. Now, the key here, Brunel, that you touched on though as well is, well, we talked about compaction potentially, but also in the uniformity of that. And you said 50-50 seeders, air seeders, let's say, and planters. We also know there's a lot of farmers out there that aren't using terribly sophisticated seeding equipment. So, and I'm saying that with all kindness, I understand, but like we've, this crop has gone on with planes before, like, and harrowed in. Mm -hmm. So, so how important then, and we said it's resilient, um, is that uniformity, regardless of depth? Well, a good rain fixes everything. It fixes all of our seeding sins. Uh, so talking about broadcast seeding or by a plane, being on the floodplain that we are, we've been there, done that. Um, there's a lot of heavy arrows with valve markets or it gets floated on and then just scratched in. We've had some of our best catches of canola where we've just barely scratched it into the ground as long as we had the right rain or the right moisture to get it going and then it's off to the races. Now, mm. I started farming or my ag career in ag in the early 90s and we were in a very wet cycle here up until the early 2000s. So for me, that's my norm and Generally, we can always count on a rain here to get the crop going. So we've always planted on the shallower side. But these last couple of years being in a drier bias, that's really, it's really hurt a lot of us going too shallow. Um, I had a guy that had a, a hoe drill with three inch spoons and he put his wheat three, four inches deep this year compared to the neighbor with the disc drill. It looked awful coming out of the ground, but it found moisture and it followed all the way down. And at the end of the day, I would have, you know, that crop still came out on top over something that was perfect or emerging coming out of the ground. So mm -hmm. like uh, Jack said, there's, it all depends. There's mm -hmm. no one way that works every single time. And we have to adjust accordingly, depending to condi conditions. So now we're going to talk soil type and you've got some good pictures for now that we're going to share in a little bit, but um, what Jack, what soil type are you typically dealing with? uh in your in your region oh gosh we we've got everything from beach sand to to heavy clay so again it's like Renal says i mean um you know you just can't have a one size fits all sort of scenario so you know growers have learned that and you know like that's why you know they they, they come up with basically i guess a recipe you know for their farm as to what will work and and uh, what will be most successful to, for them but I, I guess just something, a point I just wanted to make, Lindsay, was, you know, when you think about it, and again, I'm an old timer now, uh, but, you know, you think back, our, our, our plant densities, you know, the recommended seeding plant density for canola, you know, uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, was, you know, was 10 to 17 plants per square foot. Well, now that that's been adjusted, and right, and now we're kind of looking at that, uh, you know, five to eight. So because we've reduced uh, our target plants per square foot or acre or square meter, um, you know, our, our, our precision has to be a little bit better because, you know, when you, when you could play around with 10 to 17 plants, you know, if that was the, the, the uh, normal uh, plant population, well, you got, you got a fair bit of wiggle room in there, right? Now we don't have as much wiggle room. So if you're talking, you know, four to eight plants per square foot, uh, you lose a couple of plants per square foot now, and maybe a bit of a game changer, you know, in terms of mortality and some of the things you're looking for. So I think besides the depth, it's it's sort of the uniformity of that depth because, um, you know, we, we have to be a little more precise with our depth to ensure that we've got a uniform emergence. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we certainly we can talk a little bit about what that window is going to look like when flea beetle pressure is high. Um, because that is going to, that really has been in, in recent years, one of the biggest detriments to getting this crop 
going. I mean, once it's established, canola is remarkable, but that first window is really key. So just before we get to that, though, so John, who is his weighed in, um, tried winter canola way back in the day. So I'm just going to chip in here because Peter Johnson has already texted me to tell me he cannot make tonight's show, uh, but he is listening to it as he drives, or he's at least trying to. But um, I did want to point out, and I was wowed by this, and I shared this with Brunel and Jack just before we went live, um, that winter canola in Ontario, uh, the the yields are outstanding. Like we're talking a hundred bushels an acre and that wasn't rare. That was, you know, it happened quite a bit, but the difference is, and, and I mean, both of you have been around long enough. We've tried winter canola in the West as well, or we've tried polymer coated canola in the fall. We've tried all sorts of things. The difference though, is it's one variety. It's called Mercedes in Ontario uh, that doesn't bolt in the fall. It stays low and stays in the rosette stage and then goes gangbusters in the spring. So um, I, I we're not going to talk a lot about winter canola uh, because it's the Ontario experience, but um, I will just quickly before we go to uh, our first clip into a break. Uh, Brunella Jack, have you any experience with the fall seeded canola, any of those polymer coatings or anything that we've tried over the years in Western, in Western Canadian egg? No, I haven't. No. I've written stories. They're very limited on my end. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so I've covered it um, in that it just doesn't work. So that's that's the big part. But in, in Ontario, they've got a great variety. They've got the weather to do it. Um, so it's fantastic. And and to John's point, John says he'd love to have another crop in rotation. Uh, definitely anytime we can get a fall seeded crop for the West or the East, always a benefit, that's for sure. So um, yeah, so oh, interesting. Sure. Yeah, like it's, it's a game changer for all sorts of things. Um, okay, so before we dig into flea beetles, I want to. I'm, I'm going to go to our first clip. Uh, this is with Chris Mancher with the Canola Council, um, looking at you know after that first window, the management options we have uh, going forward. Um, so, producer Jay, if you would, let's roll that clip. What does this mean for the rest of the growing season in terms of optimizing what we have in the ground and, and whatever the conditions have that we've come through? What do we need to think about when it comes to decisions for the rest of the growing season? Yeah, so it's going to be really important to actually figure out what kind of plant stand you have here because that's going to dictate how you're going to be managing uh, the yield potential of your crop moving forward. So uh, thinking about all the different kinds of stressors and uh, challenges throughout the, ne the following growing season uh, or this current growing season, say uh, flea beetle pressure earlier on. If you have a lower plant stand, you're going to be wanting to be scouting much more frequently and applying insecticides when necessary once you reach those threshold limits. Uh, weeds are going to be more of an issue because they're going to be competitors to the canola plants they already have there. And then thinking on later into the season where uh, we may be encountering some diseases and your plant stand is also going to impact uh, those spraying decisions as well. Thin stand also impacts maturity. Yes, yeah, so if you have a thinner stand, that's going to cause your canola to actually branch out more to occupy this space. Canola is a very plastic crop, so it will fill in those gaps. However, because of that, you're going to have different staging with your flowering as well as come harvest time for maturity. So uh, that's going to impact your spraying decisions for that and also scouting for proper flowering times for fungicides as well as uh, harvesting for that because you are going to have pods on your central stem mature differently than say your uh, branching sides. Okay, that plant stand count, can you refresh us on that process and what we're aiming for there, what the ideal range is? Yeah, so the ideal range for a plant stand is five to eight plants per square foot. So if you're, when you're seeding, make sure that uh, you're setting your drills or uh, rates to that five to eight plants per square foot range. If you're a little bit lower, uh, say a three to four plants per square foot, you may be expecting about five bushels per acre lower yield potential compared to say five to six plants per square foot. But uh, you still have uh, high yield potential with those. Uh, maybe not as much as your target, but still very manageable. And there are tools available as well to help with some of those calculations, determining what your your count is and, and what it could result in? Yeah, so the Canola Council of Canada is returning its Canola Counts uh, program, its tool that was used in 2021. So if you go to canolacounts.ca, you'll be able to take advantage of this calculator that will be able to determine 
uh, using your seeding rates and your plant stands, what kind of emergence you'll be expecting, as well as helping that uh, determine your decisions later on, as well as your following season uh, for that field, whether you need to go and have a uh, higher seeding rate or lower seeding rate, depending on what you've been seeing this year. Uh, the advantage of the Canola Counts uh, tool is that uh, we'll take that information and all that data and be able to produce maps across the prairies on what kind of emergence and plant densities we're seeing. And so we can have a better idea of how to actually tailor uh, these specific regions for different seeding rates uh, for those years. <music>
you want to you want to try and have uniform emergence because you want those plants you know we, we will have some mortality but if you want eight plants per square foot you want them all there at the same time um what what we run into is when we've got either really dry conditions which we've experienced across the prairies the last two out of three years is this if you've got a situation where you have uneven seeding depth and and i've seen this in fields i've seen in the same field i've seen canola stranded in half an inch to three quarters of dry inch soil and in the same field i found canola that was into moisture about an inch inch and a half so what happens is this you've got a number of plant you, you got enough seed to get that eight plants per square foot but what happens is only the ones that are into moisture will emerge so let's say only two to three plants per square foot are able to germinate and emerge and come to the surface now you've got all of these flea beetles and and this is what you see in this picture is in this particular field we only had two to three plants per square foot and the flea beetles just pounded it it they just uh, you know this this poor plant is decimated i mean even with seed treatment again uh the the uh the flea beetles have to feed on the on the cotyledons on the leaf tissue you know to to get the insecticide so you're still in, in you know it still has to suffer feeding damage um you know even, even though it's it's treated so this is the situation we ran into with uneven seeding depth is yes there were enough canola seeds there for the stand but because some were shallow some were deep only half of them emerged or less than half emerged and of course those first few plants that came out of the ground what did the flea beetles do they just mobbed them they just mobbed these mm -hmm. plants and you know they didn't have a chance they didn't mm -hmm. have a chance so, and Brunel, you brought up the point about stem feeding versus cotyledon feeding as well. Um, you mentioned it in corn stubble. Do you see it in, you know, on wheat stubble or on other stubble as much? Or is it really uh, more of an issue in corn stubble because of those sort of elongated stems? No, it's an issue wherever we have canola planted and there's high flea beetle populations. Uh, it just jogged my memory. Now I should have sent you a picture. You could see the top had a little bit of flea beetle feeding, but then you got down and you looked underneath and I have a picture where there, I think there's seven flea beetles on one or two plants chewing on the stems and on the undersides of the leaves. So it's not mm. just the case. And under dry conditions where the ground might open up a little bit too, you can find feeding you know, below the soil surface slightly. So it's it's not just a case of looking and assessing from the top. You, you've got to pull plants and look at what they're doing. They like yeah. to hide underneath uh, on windy days, and we have no shortage of windy days where we are on the prairies, as flat yeah. as we are. So definitely a lot of feeding going on underneath or as much often as on top. So Brunel, if you're trying to assess a field like that for the potential to have to go in with a foliar spray, do you how do you weight that stem feeding because is like stem feeding is is worse is it not like it'll kill it versus cotyledon feeding yeah it'll definitely do a lot of damage um i guess making the decision to spray or not to might be at what stage the canola is how far what the weather is like two years ago we had a lot of flea beetle pressure and it was relentless it just didn't want to stop we had seeded early because we wanted the canola to flower outside of the heat window, but it, it really turned around and bit us because it was so cold that the canola, first it took two weeks to come out of the ground, then it just sat and sat and sat and the flea beetles had weeks to chew on it. And mm. they just kept coming and coming and coming. It was quite the slaughter. In comparison, this past year, we started off really cold, but everybody, the guys, a lot of guys waited because uh, they remembered the flea beetle pressure from the year before. And for us, the weather went from cold. We, we didn't really have a spring. It went from cold to 25 degree days almost uh, overnight. And so then the canola popped out of the ground and it was off to the races. And before we knew it, we were out of the stage that flea beetles could have any kind of an effect on it. So that would be one of the reasons that we tend to maybe wait a little bit longer right now or at these last mm -hmm. couple of years that and being on the drier side it seems that we're getting it we're the guys that are waiting are catching a july august early august rain that benefits on that end versus trying to seed early and not having how, the rains in, in july yeah how different it is for now when i think about like the early 2000s or where it was the best canola got snow on it 
right? Mm -hmm. um, meaning it was in super early and it got that bit of snow for moisture that melted right in and away you go. And you know what? Maybe that still happens. But I, I think, and Jack, similar question to you, um, in where you are in a dry bias most years, is there is there a tendency to wait well into May to to see what kind of moisture conditions you're in or because that's definitely a risk right if 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 the soil is cold and the seed you know germinates but just barely like it can get wiped out by flea beetles so quickly yeah it, it's you know again it, it, it no no one recipe or no one uh, prescription will well, necessarily work every year. And that and that's where farmers have to rely kind of on their experience, you know, and what they've done in the past. So, I mean, typically the rule in, in, in Southern Alberta, Southern Saskatchewan in the brown, dark brown soil zone is early seeding, you know, to beat the heat, uh, to make use of that early spring moisture, because if we don't catch, you know, any rains uh, in May, you know, the soil is only going to dry out. I mean, the wind, whatever, starts to dry out. So, you know, the, the rule is usually earlier is better, uh, except, like I say, for two two years ago, um, you know, uh, we had that cold, dry spring. You know, everything just sat there. Um, you know, a crop that did come out of the ground just got pounded by flea beetles. Um, yeah, it was it, it was it was tough to deal with. Um, you know, last year we didn't have the flea beetles. We didn't have as much of the problem. So, so weird. It, yeah, yeah it, it's kind of like we you know, because we were all expecting, you know, another, uh, you know, plague of, of, of flea beetles coming, mm -hmm. but it didn't, it didn't show up. But uh, it, it's, it, it's tough to gauge, you know, typically, like I say, there'll be a lot of, uh, there'll be a lot of producers that say they still believe that earlier is better. Um, you know, they, they, they've, they've got reasons for that. Uh, and also, I know, I, you know, the entomologists are now promoting or saying that later is better, because especially with two, with the striped flea beetle, uh, you know, emerging a couple of weeks earlier than Crucifer, you know, the feeding damage is earlier. So they're saying, you know, wait, you know, wait. So that you have your emergence. You know, the, the key oh is goodness. to get that, yeah. the, you know, the key is to get that, that canola from that cotyledon stage to that three to four leaf stage, you know, as fast yeah. as possible. Yeah. Mm hmm So, and, and realistically, if you're looking at a two week forecast, um, it's sometimes accurate. And sometimes not, but there's also not much we can do about it. And we got to get over those acres. So, uh, but it's definitely a discussion we had on this show many times was, you know, should we be delaying canola seeding? Maybe we, maybe the beans should be going in first or, you know, or something else in that, you know, just to, just to avoid the flea beetle pressure that's been so high. Um, any guesses, because I think 23 really surprised a lot of us that the, the flea beetle pressure wasn't where we suspected it would be. Um, cutworms, I get the sense, cutworms were a lot worse, but flea beetles were not. Do either of you, for now, maybe I'll ask you first, any uh, any wild theories about why that might have been? Well, uh, to answer the question about cutworms, we haven't had any cutworms, serious cutworm problems in our era for, area for a while. Um, in terms of the flea beetles, I think it was just the growing conditions. Again, seeding early versus seeding a bit later and having that canola pop out of the ground and take off really quick. And I would have to also say there's been a lot more of the higher end seed treatments, insecticides that are better at managing the flea beetles or that buy you a little bit more time once it's just out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Those, I think, have given a pretty good leg up and... When we look at the price of those seed treatments, um, I guess just to pu put a plug in for the guys that have planters where we're typically seeding at a half seeding rate, the cost of that product per acre is also half. So it's it's almost right. a no brainer in that sense for some guys. And it's a yeah, it's a good point. If you're going to save on seed, spend it on protection uh, for said seed. So because and this Jack gets back to your point about the numbers game. Uh, typically in a planter setting, you, you have more precision, you're cutting back the rate, but it's all about how many plants you end up with. Um, and if there are fewer plants, maybe to start with, if they're better protected, uh, perhaps exactly that, but now to your point, you still get there, right? It's There's a thousand ways to get there. It's just which mm -hmm. one works for you, yeah. right? Um, so on the, well, Jack, just quickly, any suspicions on your end on why flea beetles didn't end up being 
the huge issue? I don't have any answers, Lindsay. I wish I did. Um, yeah, it, it, it just didn't materialize. You know, some, some insects, you know, if, listening to a number of agronomic updates, you know, some, you know, you can forecast, some you just cannot forecast. And, you know, yeah. uh, cutworm is one of those that, uh, you know, they, they really can't forecast very well. Flea beetles is another one. Um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. try as you might to try and model them or forecast, you know, it, it just doesn't happen. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I've always used, I, I guess, you know, fall populations is a bit of a guideline. You know, if you've got, you know, in the fall when you're swathing or harvesting and you're seeing some some pretty high adult numbers, you know those ones are going to overwinter. So I've always used that as, as a bit of an indicator. Hey, if, if there's some really high populations of adults in this particular area in the fall, you know, be on top of scouting next spring, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, and again, you know, going back to the numbers game thing, again, if, if you're on the lower end of the plant population, this is, was mentioned in the video, you need to be, you know, make, make sure you spend the money on, on, on better seed treatment, on, on some of those really good seed treatments. And the other thing is that field, you know, uh, you queue it up to, to, to make sure you monitor it and scout it to be on top of it and, and not, yeah. uh, you know, not let it slide uh, through the cracks. Yeah, be out there first. Okay, we got some uh, a couple of good questions that have come in. Um, I did want to say, Jason C., I am going to ask you a question about soil moisture probes, but a little later. Um, and hello to Alan, who's also joined us. But Colin's got a question. He's in central Saskatchewan. Um, and on this topic of flea beetles, I'll sort of generalize this. Any experience with larger small seed size making a difference with, now this is in relation to flea beetles, or uh, varieties specifically hybrid uh, tolerant uh name brand so i i can't say i've ever seen any work that would attribute one to the other i think i've seen lots of work at brunel as you said on the actual treatments and comparing seed treatments but um, i know there's lots of ver or variability between seed size and i know that often is a question about seed vigor or uh you know how quickly they get out of the ground but uh brunel any observations I wouldn't say that I've noticed any real difference between seed size, but it's not something that I've looked at very close or it's not something that I'd ever heard of or come across in any kind of research work being done on that end of it. Mm -hmm. Like you said, a lot of work at looking at early season vigor and in a lot of crops, a bigger seed generally is got more vigor. It's got more horsepower. It's got more reserves to get out of the ground and establish roots. Um, but no, I can't say that that would have any, that I've ever noticed any kind of an effect on flea beetle pressure. Mm -hmm. Jack, same for you. Or have you noticed any differences? It would be the same. I mean, again, you know, the theory is, I mean, if you've got a, a you know, a more vigorous plant that's going to grow faster, you know, that that's going to give it, uh, you know, an advantage, a, a slight advantage. Um, and, and perhaps when you've got low end threshold populations of flea beetles, you know, you might maybe see some possible you know possible benefit to that but i'm thinking you know again to two years ago and it didn't matter you know yeah. everything was was just absolutely hammered in fact comment i'll make is you know have, working in southern alberta where we have mustard you know there's been talk about uh, breeding canola to have more hairs on the leaves you know because yeah. flea beetles don't like hairs we had mustard that had to be sprayed and of course mustard wow. has, has hairy leaves so again and when it's you spicy <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and no, I, I was in fields of of mustard that were severely handled wow. with with flea beetles. So you know, when when you've got uh, the situation bad as we had two years ago, yeah, I don't think anything really made much difference. Because there has been work into hairy canola, uh, and I think there's work ongoing. I think though, I mean, to that point, Jack, I think in in perhaps more uh, you know average conditions that yeah. maybe you know that mustard wouldn't be the crop of choice so if we had hairy canola options in average conditions maybe that that does become another tool in the toolbox for sure yeah. um okay before we have some really cool photos of soil of uh some really great establishment that i want to get through but uh let's uh producer jay if you would let's go to our last sponsor read of the night and then we'll get into some of that as well as we're going to talk phosphorus and sulfur uh, okay. Our sponsors for The Agronomists are Real Egg Shops, The Canola School, and Profitable Practices. Profitable Practices on Real Agriculture is a video series featuring Canadian producers who are adopting farm practices to have a positive impact on profit, people, and the planet. 
Profitable Practices is made possible by support from Farm Credit Canada and RBC Royal Bank. I would just like to note in that video series, you can check out me and my farm. Anyway, um, it's just a little shameless plug there. That's fine. Okay, let's talk soil. And this all really does center around uh, the, the seeding pass about uh, on establishment. I want to talk soil, but I also want to talk uh, phosphorus and sulfur. So Brunel, you've got some, you sent in some really good slides uh, to look at some of the different options we've got when that crop goes in um, to compare some of our options with row cleaners, et cetera. Um, and so as these come up, we'll get through those. And, uh, and then I do want to talk about, you've got a really neat photo of soil that we're going to talk about that many people have not seen. Okay, so walk us through these slides, though, Brunel. Um, I think we're going to compare this one and the next one, right? Sure. So these slides were done, we were doing some demonstrations. So these are just single strips, but looking at different planter settings and how they had an effect on emergence. And it was canola. And I threw these slides in here. I sent them because they echoed kind of what Jack was saying about the importance of putting that seed into moisture or putting it into uniform moisture so that we get even emergence. So what we're seeing here is with row cleaners. Now, on the planter, we can outfit row cleaners. Usually they're used to move away, trash away, but you can see on this field, there's not a whole lot of trash, but we did have very dry conditions where the top inch or two were very dry. So as a producer, they made the decision, let's use the row cleaners to just throw away a little bit of the dirt. That way we're putting our canola into moisture, but not having to go that you know inch and a half to two inches deep to find it. Mm -hmm. So this is with row cleaners, and then the next one would kind of, would be without. So now much poorer depth control, and you can see the variability there. You know, you've got parts where there might be a little bit more compaction, better seed to soil contact, other parts where the canola is half the size where it might have come up. You know, usually we'll see it come up over a span of it could be as much as a week, if not more, under really dry conditions, but the, the, the mm -hmm. key is just like any crop is to try to have most of it out in the same span of one to two days. Yep. What is the row width here for now? Uh, this What's would be 22 there? inch rows. Okay. Yeah. That I would um, say is probably one of the biggest downsides to the planter is row spacing. So yeah, uh, it can be a problem at harvest time if we're swathing. It can be a problem yeah. with weed control. <laughs> you know, when we talk about herbicide tolerant varieties, there's some weaker chemistries out there that really rely on covering the ground yeah. fast in the spring. So these, these would not be a good fit in that type of scenario, especially when it comes to things like kochia and we're dealing with water hemp now, which yep. are two weeds that love to germinate throughout the season. Mm -hmm. Jack, you do not want water hemp. Tell, tell Manitoba to keep it. You really don't <laughs> want it. You got enough kochia though. So yeah. yeah Jason, we, I, yeah, kosher... pun, I asked about spacing. Go ahead, Jack. Oh, uh, you. No, I, I was going to say we, we got enough problems with kochia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is a, just a terrible weed. Uh, okay, producer Jay, if you would. Oh, there. Here we go. Okay, so this is row firmers. So this is row firmers. Now this is often a wheel or a little plastic tab that follows in the furrow behind where the seed gets okay. dropped. So it just helps press that seed into the bottom of the trench and minimize any kind of seed bounce. So mm -hmm. this would okay. be one of the distinguishing factors between a a planter and say a hoe drill aside right. from seed singulation but seed singulation is not as big a factor with canola because as you mentioned right. in the video with chris and kelvin there it's um it's very elastic it'll fill in empty spaces yeah it will but but to your point about the the weed control in really wide spaces it will but later so yeah i mean right like so that early season weed control really is key because i mean if anyone has scouted you know, canola that's potting, you literally can't walk through it. Like, Brunel, you can. I get lost. Um, <laughs> it's just, it knits together. It's like, it's like a wall and you can't get through it. But when it's we, it, it really, I mean, yes, it'll grow through and it'll grow gangbusters, but it really doesn't cover those rows. Not like soybeans. Apparently, where apparently. We want them to... 
that's how they assess the yield in Australia. They take a running start at the field and depending on how many steps they can take, they just keep <laughs> knocking bushels off before they fall flat on their face. I love, I love the science behind that. Um, there you go. Okay. So this is, this is without row firmers. Also, they should use me to estimate. I wouldn't get far. Uh, okay. So that's a significant difference. So this is a drill. This is a hoe drill. Did you say? Well, oh, this is still a planter. Oh, this is the planter. I don't think the, yeah, row firmers. Yeah, you wouldn't get them in a. I'm not sure if you can get that on a disc drill or not yeah. with a single disc. But it's, so it's not the same. Why do the Why do the rows look closer to me though? Is that just perspective? It looks like it's a it narrow row spacing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it just looks like that. Um, also, um, so are these from 2023? These would have been or from 2020, I think. 2021. Oh, maybe. okay. Okay. Very cool. Now. Um, Jay, if we could, producer Jay, if you could bring up a photo for and I'm going to describe it. Okay, it's 2022. I'm going to describe this photo for, for those if you're not, uh, if you're listening and not watching. Um, it's, uh, it's a phenomenon that I've experienced, uh, but I experienced it first in a soil pit. So it almost looks like what I, what are we calling this leopard or like cheetah print on, on the soil surface? Um, it, it's these lines of very dark soil in between this clay. And I have seen it, you know, in profile through a soil pit and it's very bizarre. So Bruno, what are we looking at? So this is in Southern Manitoba. This is in the Red River Valley. Um, what the heck? That is very bizarre looking. And look at the size mm -hmm. of it. your shoes there. So you can see my shoe. That's a size 11 for reference. Um, so what we're looking at is where we dug a surface drain in this one field. So the yellow clay material that you see there, that's the high calcium parent material of uh, the Red River Valley. And then the dark stuff is high organic matter. So that's, we're on the Lake Agassiz floodplain. So our soils, these soils have probably been only on, or out of the water for about 5,000 or have been forming for about 5,000 years since Lake Agassiz retreated. So what we're seeing is these black veins in there and I call it a honeycomb pattern, but same thing. These, like Lindsay said, when you dig a soil pit, you see it from the, a different plane. These dark soils are a form of V and they go about two or three feet deep. And it's basically that's it's high organic matter soils that shrink and swell more than the parent material. So every winter they shrink or they freeze and they crack, and then it just keeps filling with more topsoil and pushing out and pushing out. So it's, it's got nothing to do with canola necessarily, but it just shows what <laughs> okay. it's, it's it's exactly. a really neat picture to look at. It is really neat, but it does bring into our conversation of soil sampling. Um, and there was a question about using uh, that Jason's got about using soil moisture probes to try and estimate yields um, in a dry year to see if there's more bushels there. But this also brings up, which is a neat segue into phosphorus and sulfur. So maybe we'll start with sulfur because, of course, canola, unlike many other crops in rotation, canola has a pretty high sulfur demand. Um, and sulfur is also one of those those nutrients that can be more challenging uh, to manage just because it's not always readily available depending on the source. So Jack, I'll start with you. You're in a drier area. Does that make the sulfur question much more difficult? Um, or how do you plan for sulfur with canola in rotation? Well, when we're looking at our drier areas, I mean, moisture, seabed moisture is, 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 is one of those factors that, you know, has a huge amount effect on, on, toxicity of, of seed placed fertilizers. So typically when we've got dry conditions, you know, the rule of thumb is to, you know, reduce your seed placed fertilizer by 50%, you know, just a margin of safety to, to allow for, for the, the toxicity, the salt effect, you know, of, of that fertilizer. Now, um, it depends then on, on the source of your, of your sulfur. Now in the, you know, with our, with our old fertilizers, our ammonium sulfate, you know, the rule is keep that ammonium sulfate away from the seed row. I mean, again, because of the of the salt effect, the toxicity from the ammonium sulfate. Um, the thing that's changed, Lindsay, is now we've got other sulfur products out there, you know, in the last few years that, you know, uh, combine ammonium sulfate and elemental. When, and now we've got a number with what's called or what are called micro ionized uh, sulfur, uh, elemental sulfur. So, you know, we're starting to see, you know, a, a trend now that, well, it's okay if you want to apply, you know, uh, some of this uh, 
of these, let's say, blended products or hybrid products that are partly elemental, partly ammonium sulfate, you know, um, in, into the seed row to, you know, to get some sulfur there close to the seed. Um, it's a compromise. You know, some of these products are 50% ammonium sulfate, 50% elemental. Um, and when you start looking at stand thinning, you know, there's been many studies done on this. What you do is you see is, is that the game, when you're using ammonium sulfate in the seed row, you know, you get some pretty heavy, you know, stand thinning of plants per square foot, you know, due to that. Uh, if you go to strictly elemental, um, yeah, it's much safer, safer fertilizer and much less reduction in stand. And then if you're using these products that are a combination of elemental and ammonium, you know, they sort of fit in between, um, you know, uh, between in, in terms of mortality and stand thinning. But elemental also isn't all available the year you apply it. So, so that throws another wrench in it. Brunel, you've, were you part of the trials that was looking at seed play sulfur and what we can kind of get away with? Or did you attend some of those uh, talks on that? Uh, those were some of our own trials that we helped facilitate. So we were hired to look at seed place safety of some of these newer products that are a combination ammonium sulfate elemental, or some of them are all elemental. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at it to see, you know, how much safer are these products in terms of stand loss compared to traditional MAP and ammonium sulfate. And even though we were in a drier bias, um, it was a big surprise to me how much we could get away with in the valley here. And mm. what we call dry probably is nothing compared to what Jack sees in terms of being dry. Like we might have the yeah. top few inches are dry, but we got lots of moisture underneath. And very mm -hmm. seldom do we not have a rain to kind of, again, fix all of our problems. Mm -hmm. So we were finding that we could get away with all sorts. The only time we saw any kind of significant stand reduction where we cut our stand in half was when we forgot to shut either tank off. So we had two tanks going with two different products okay. at full rate. Okay, so that's good to know. <laughs> that's I'm a not saying we can get away <laughs> with anything. But there's yeah, kind of there is a limit. Sitting on yeah, the days that we are. Yeah, but it was yeah we were purposely trying to find stand reductions. That's not to say that there wasn't any pruning of roots or anything because of the. Yeah high rates of fertilizer uh, one thing that we did find is we did see some sulfur deficiencies in some of the lower rates where we were going with products that are higher rate of elemental yeah so we have to be careful there if we're using those types of products mm -hmm. um, if you're using them across your rotation so if you're using these same products in your cereals and your other crops where you're putting on a little bit of like where you're putting on elemental every year yeah. then you're building your soil reserves and those seem to be fine. But if you're making a switch to those types of products, you may need to supplement with ammonium sulfate somewhere, somehow to, to make mm -hmm. that transition is what, we're, what we found. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Jack, that's, um, I guess that that is the follow-up then is that, you know, sulfur is one of those, it isn't always necessarily something you can address in one year. Um, so, so do you find that that farmers that you're working with are applying sulfur throughout their crop rotation to to build that up, or is it still mostly the focus when the canola goes in the ground? Well, I think Lindsay, what we, you know, let's put it this way: we've got growers now that've been growing canola for a number of years, and so that you know, um, there's very little canola that, that's that's planted that doesn't get some sulfur with it, you know, at, at seeding time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know. There's very, very little canola that goes in the ground without some sulfur, whatever, regardless of, of what the source is. You know, some of the growers have, have made the connection with sulfur. And, you know, when we start, started talking cereals with, with protein levels in wheat, and we've seen certainly a, a benefit, you know, to wheat, uh, higher protein levels when you've got, you know, good nitrogen, good sulfur levels. But one of the things I just want to go back on, Lindsay, was we can talk about plant thinning. But some of the studies that I've seen, you know, so, for example, there's one study that, that was done in around 2013 or whatever. You know, they, they applied 18 pounds of MAP and 18 pounds of ammonium sulfate in the seed row. They had fairly significant plant reduction, but they still got an 11 bushel yield increase. Hmm. So it goes back to, to canola. It's such a resilient plant. It, 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 it takes a licking, but it keeps on ticking. 
And, you know, um, if, if at the end of the day, if the goal is to put bushels in the bin, uh, you lose a few plants, but then you've got more resources of sulfur and phosphate for the plants that are left. And so then those that are left seem to respond and, you know, you've got a yield boost. Um, in fact, actually, one study I looked at, you know, they had all kinds of combinations of 18 pounds of, uh, of MAP to 36 pounds of MAP to combinations with ammonium sulfate and then, you know, with some of these uh, elemental and ammonium sulfate uh, combinations. And every single, they had stand thinning to some degree, but every single treatment showed a yield increase, whether it be seven to, to 12 bushels an acre. So um, it's such a resilient plant that uh, it yeah. can make a liar out of it's a, it's magic. I was going to ask for now. So you you definitely saw a hit when both products full rate for sure. Did you take those trials to yield? We did. No, we did and? not see a yield difference. Well, interesting for us. But yep, heavy clay soils, a farm that is typically not shy on fertilizer. Now that being said, we did do the same. Unbeknownst to us, we were doing some demonstration plots with the planter again on sandy soils. And same thing, there was one strip that came up very poor, half a crop. And we found out afterwards that the tractor driver had flipped the tank on. And I can't remember if it was five or 10 gallons of 1034 went down in furrow with the canola, which is a big no-no. Yeah. So we thought, well, it's, this is interesting. And we took it to yield, but we did not see a, a yield bump there either. Yeah. There you go. All right. Okay. Let's touch on phosphorus though, while we're still sticking with the with seed uh phosphorus of course i mean it's everybody's favorite buddy uh for seed do we have to worry about any uh effects for now i'll start with you what have you seen with phosphorus well it's kind of what i've just mentioned we've seemed to be able to get away with a lot these last couple of years anyway but it's when we look at provincial recommendations they're across a much wider geography and um yeah it's, it all depends it all comes down like jack said to soil moisture if you've got dry conditions yep. play it safe if you've got lots of wet conditions or if it you know if you had i've been told before in the past as long as you have three to five tenths of an inch of rain three days before within the three days before or three days after seeding you can usually put whatever down in the seed row and get away with it so mm. little things yeah yep now Jack, you did mention, of course, most seed is going to, or canola is going to go in with some, some sulfur. Is it also then usually going in with some phosphorus as well? Yes. I mean, um, you know, canola is a heavy, heavy feeder on phosphorus. I mean, you're usually looking at uh, a pound per bushel of yield kind of thing as a requirement. So, you know, you, you definitely need your phosphorus levels for, for canola. Um, you know, what we are seeing is we've got the provincial guidelines that, that you know, are anywhere from 20 to 25 pounds of actual P205 with the seed as being the upper limit. But I'll, I'll be honest, Lindsay, you know, in my career in the last few years, I've seen growers that have been pushing those levels. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, you know, and, 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 and some of them are saying that they're not seeing any ill effect, you know, on, on pushing uh, those levels. But again, it all depends on your individual circumstances, whether you got a sandy soil versus, you know, a good clay loam, whether you're in dry conditions versus, you know, fairly moist conditions. Um, you know, I, I can remember back in our, our days when I was with Alberta Agriculture, we were doing diagnostic schools. You know, we, we were doing some demonstration trials with seed placed fertilizer. Uh, we should have, you know, knocked the starch rate out of, the, out of that crop. What happened was we got a two inch rain, you know, uh, two days after seeding. And, um, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the plots that had the higher, you know, seed place fertilizer looked the best. Again, it's, right. it's the, the, I call it the healing power of water. Uh, if That's you right. get a timely rain and good moisture conditions, you know, uh, that, that, can, um, that can cover mm -hmm. over a lot of mistakes. So, you know, again, yeah. it, 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 it's all depending on that. The one thing we are concerned about, you know, is, is we are looking, even though regardless of what we're putting down, uh, you know, we're still somewhat deficient on our application rates of, of phosphate overall when you start mm -hmm. looking at our nitrogen rates in comparison. Um, you know, um, so uh, we are seeing, I'm, I'm seeing so more and more soil tests coming back with, with lower levels of, of available phosphate. 
And no, that's just not in, in you know, in, in canola. It's, it's across all of our crops right. that we're seeing, you know, somewhat of a, of a what have called maybe a deficit of phosphate in, in our soil reserves. We we need more hog barns, right, Pernell? Just everywhere, all over. <laughs> just bring on the bacon. Over. <laughs> yeah, the, what? The, yeah, um, it's a bit of a sore spot, uh, I tell everybody. When, uh, but yeah, go ahead. When it comes to fertilizer, though, one comment that I want to think, I think we have to give a bit of a nod to that the varieties that we have these days are a lot more resilient than what yes. they would have been 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, and the, the, when canola first came out compared to what they are now, they're so much more resistant to... Well, I'm not just saying fertilizer burn, but things like sclerotinia. And yeah. when I was going back 20 years, when I started my career, we never would have thought of not spraying a fungicide. And now it seems like we can get away with, we can be a little bit more choosy as to when and where we use a fungicide and still yeah. like not have the disease pressure that we've had before. But I think that genetics have come a long way and, and fertilizer efficiency as well. We're seeing yeah. a lot of crops where we don't need as much fertilizer to grow the yields that we used to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're bang on the money with that comment because, you know, when you look at these guidelines, you know, the, these have been since the 1990s. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like we, Maybe we need, we need to, to be canola. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We look at canola. Well, when I started my career, it was three and a half to three and a three quarter pounds of N per bushel. And now we're using three as a number. Corn used to be, you know, one, one and a half, and now we're under one pound per bushel. Uh, wheat as well used to be, I think, two and three quarter, two and a half pounds of N, and yeah. now we're down to two, two and a quarter. The, the yeah. varieties are a lot more efficient than what they have been in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, efficient, but also there is so much more yield potential you have to feed it, right? So... Mm -hmm. there's there's there but that that does mean for the same you know pound of product or or nutrient you you can get more yield which is pretty fantastic yeah. excellent point for now tip of the hat to all our plant breeders out there uh and all those seed companies working hard to try and solve some of our problems now i'm going to end with this this is good so we started the the discussion um looking back at you know perhaps some better than expected yields from the 2023 crop, even though it was really dry. So Jason asks, is there any feedback from growers using soil moisture probes to help provide some information on the better than expected crop? So um, I'll put it to either of you. Uh, any indications of anything that growers are doing or farmers are doing that we're trying to narrow down where they, they figured their yield potential would end up that were helpful? Jack, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. Well, to answer about soil moisture probes, um, I haven't had any growers that we that we work with that, that that were able to relate any of that information. I will mention though that what I've seen on dry land, and and there'll be some some growers that will uh, validate this. You know, it, going back to some of the things that we learned, you know, earlier on in the '90s when we had other droughts, i.e., using stripper headers, those sorts of things. I know they created some issues for for trash management and residue management, but the growers in 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 the southern part of the province, you know, are are just seeing uh, tremendous response using something like a stripper header because again, it traps snow. Uh, the tall stubble traps snow. Uh, it helps reduce the evapotranspiration at the soil surface, so it just improves the moisture use efficiency, you know, of you know uh, for for that crop. And so, you know, going back to some tried and true agronomy, uh, anything that you can do to improve moisture use efficiency, you know, is, is going to translate into better yield. And that also goes into weed control because weeds use moisture. So if you're in a moisture deficit, you don't want the weeds to get any, you know, use any of that precious moisture at all. So, um, mm -hmm. but on the moisture probe thing, I use a, I, I do a lot of moisture probing myself. Um, just to get an idea of what's going on in the field and get an idea of potential, but I don't have any other response or any uh, uh, information mm -hmm. from growers. Brunel, in a dry year, you could just lose your moisture probe down one of the cracks in the soil, <laughs> and it would just be, <laughs> and it would just be gone. Has anyone ever seen those? Gra anyway, um, yes. Any extra? Do you use a soil moisture probe, Brunel? Do do I do not, um, other than a hand one every once in a while, just kind of dabbling with it. Um, they are becoming more and more popular with the Internet of Things now. We're actually looking at a project where we would create a private weather network 
with a bunch of the clients that we work with just to get a better read overall where farmers could subscribe. But the whole idea is, you know, with these, I call them personal weather stations, but they're, the price on them has come down considerably. And the fact that we can hook them all up to the internet for cheap and be able to access them on any mobile device. I think there's a wealth of information that we should be able to tap into as farmers and that's, yeah. Um, soil moisture probes being one of them too. They probably can depend on where you put them in the field, but I think that we can account for that with, yep. you know, the having more of them or a bigger volume of them, but also just mm-hmm. tracking the weather better and even even doing a better job of tracking rainfall data. You know, if we yeah. could do that every three to four miles instead of every thirty to forty miles. Yeah. Or fifty to or sixty miles, hundred miles, where the the province has their weather stations. I think that would go yeah. a long way in terms of modeling and yield predictions and even disease forecasting. Yeah, for sure. Um, I feel like that is an excellent use of someone's time. And please keep us posted on you mm-hmm. doing that. Because um, it feels like uh, that's next summer's project, which I will say, well, we're looking. yeah, it's a, it's a, this show, we have to come up with either a new, like, master's project or PhD project every time. But that just, that sounds like an excellent summer project for someone uh, to have all the stations right. talk to each other. So away you go. If you have two or three farmers that are neighboring where they might yep. each need three to five stations on their own, if we group them together, you know, we might need yep. three, five, six, seven amongst the three or four of them. And all of a sudden that really helps with with the cost of such a, an endeavor. And yeah. I think it's something that we really should be looking at. Yeah, for sure. It, I, I mean, it, it informs on the yes yields prediction side, which helps on the marketing side, but very much could play into exactly that, that disease forecasting, uh, that decision to spray or not to spray or when to spray um, really could make a big difference. All right, we are out of time. Mm-hmm. You'll note, um, I think we got through most of sort of the, the beginning of the season stuff. Um, and that's okay because we're going to come back and talk canola. Uh, we've got some, some comments on, of course, the harvest management side, all of those things, but that will have to wait for another day. Uh, Jack, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, all right. And Brunel, uh, have a great time at Ag Days and good luck. Right on. Thanks. Sorry about the video quality. I'm not. No, that's sure okay. It, sometimes it happens to me. It's a okay. All right. There's well, that in. does it for us. <laughs> yeah, there's new in. Now we can see you. Uh, yeah, that does it for us. Thank you to our show sponsors, of course, to Profitable Practices, to the Canola School, uh, and to Real Ag Shops. Head on over to our YouTube channel. You can check out uh, all of those there. Um, And yeah, we'll be back next week. Next week, we're going to talk about cover crops in Western Canada and Eastern Canada, figuring out the right fit, uh, figuring out what role you want those cover crops uh, to fill. And uh, so Peter Johnson will be on and Dr. Yvonne Lolly from the University of Manitoba is going to join me for that. Uh, Thank you all for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers.